Good morning, everyone. It's good to see everyone this morning. Let's stand and worship. with him in a death like his we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin Romans 6 5 and 6 I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I 
just want to speak the name of Jesus till every dark addiction starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom I see Because you rose from the grave, Lord, we have freedom and we have victory in your name. We have freedom from anxiety, anxiety and depression and fear. Lord, we speak Jesus. We speak your holy name. We thank you for the sacrifice you made and the love that you have shown. We thank you, Lord, and because you live, we can face tomorrow. Praise you.
praise your holy name.
What a difference Easter Sunday makes in our faith and in our belief and in our life after death. Amen. It's good to see you here this morning. We're going to look at a familiar passage of the resurrection in John chapter 20. And you can follow along. It'll be on the screen. Megan had you standing for so long. I'm tempted to have you sit during the, the, the scripture reading, but this is probably the most important thing. Amen. Let's stand together. Those who can. John chapter 20. Oh, it's, it's, Megan and I have this thing about standing, so. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark. And saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter, to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out with the other disciple, John, and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and John outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloth lying there, and he did not go in. Then Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then John, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that Jesus must rise again from the dead. Then Peter and John went back again to their own homes. But Mary Magdalene stood outside the tomb Weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. The angel said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When Mary said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, did not know it was Jesus. He said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She supposed him to be the gardener, said to Jesus. Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, Jesus is ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Lord, thank you for this empty tomb story, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a reality to us today. That's why we are here. And we pray that you'll bless this word to us and encourage us by it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the defining moment of the Christian faith. All Christian beliefs revolve around Easter. Even our worship on Sunday mornings is because of Jesus' resurrection. Sunday worship is supposed to serve as a reminder each and every week of the power of resurrection. David read that scripture this morning that from Paul, Philippians, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. See, our Lord's resurrection is the reason that even during Lent, we would take a break from our fasting on Sundays because it's a day for feast and a day for worship. It's a day when we put aside the negatives and focus on the positive because he is alive. So Resurrection Day is so important, we spend weeks preparing for it through this season we call Lent. The liturgical colors on this day changed to white. Yes, I was up on the ladder. Yes, we change it to white because we want to remember. 
We decorate our homes in this time of the year. Debbie has a whole section for Easter, right? I mean, we, and we, we put spring flowers out if you've got them already. And, and uh, if we're not, you put the fake flowers out. I mean, we decorate because this is spring. This is Easter. This is new life. Some even buy new clothes for Easter. It's a good excuse, right? I got to wear something new. So some do that. Some, sometimes that's the only guy, time guys get new shirts. All right, well, some give small gifts at Easter. Some give chocolate, shaped like bunnies for some reason. We greet each other with, he is risen. Yeah, because of Easter. It is a great time of celebration. Jesus is alive, sin and death have been defeated. But it would be a mistake to view this Resurrection Sunday as only a one-time act of history that we observe and celebrate. That it happened 2,000 years ago. Because of the power of resurrection wasn't just that Jesus was raised from the dead. But also, God's power of resurrection was unleashed upon the world. We can live for Christ in the power of the resurrection each and every day. We can share in the power of resurrection in a world plagued by sin and death. And we do believe in a promised resurrection of the dead. Whenever a Christian dies, we know that there's something beyond this world. I wondered again this week, how important is Easter? I struggled to think, Jesus, how can I present this old story But it is, it's the same. There's nothing new to be said. And then it hit me. Easter is the first day of Christianity. There were lots of firsts on Easter Sunday. But maybe the most important, it's the first day of Christianity. Jesus died and rose again. So let's look at the garden here for a moment. Our scripture said it was on the first day of the week that Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early. While it was still dark, saw that the stone had been taken away. So it was the first day of the week when Mary Magdalene and other women, if you were here for the sunrise service, the passage in Mark was read where it talked about some other women that were with her. When they went real early and and they came to the tomb and they was wondering how are we going to be able to wrap the body in spices and stuff and, and uh, with, uh, with the stone in, in place and, and so on. They were concerned. They wanted to take care of him, but it was too late Friday night to be able to do so. And of course, the Sabbath, they couldn't do any of that kind of stuff. So now it's Sunday morning. They came and here the stone was already moved and they went in and the tomb was empty. So it's on the first day of the week. And then they, that's when they discovered that the, the resurrection of Christ was a first for Christianity in that because it was the first day of the week, it changed worship from Sabbath, Saturday, to Sunday morning. So we say the first day of the week, he's emphasizing, John is, that this is a change. In fact, Jesus meets him that evening for the first worship service. Thomas wasn't there, so he had to wait until the next Sunday to feel Jesus and see him for himself. That's what happens when you miss worship. Had to wait a whole week to get the good news. So this was the change that our worship went from Saturday to Sunday. And another first was that women, not men, were the first people to see the empty tomb and to discover the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now that's a pretty big deal. All three women said yes. (laughs) Now these women went and told Peter and John, the guys who, who then had a running race to the tomb, they discovered it was empty, but they struggled with knowing that what to believe. And so Mary, who had not run, but walked back to the, to the tomb, Mary Magdalene, remained, and they went back. John said he believed. Peter didn't know what to believe at that point in time. But Mary Magdalene waited outside. She was still just struggling. What's going on? And she was so filled with grief that when she encountered Jesus, she believed him to be a gardener. 
tending to the stuff there in, in that garden where he was buried. And John was illustrating a theological truth here that the sin that entered the world in the first garden was conquered in the second garden through Christ's resurrection. Jesus is a gardener of sorts causing new growth and new life where there was once death. Remember what happened in the first garden? Sin and death. Now the resurrection in the second garden. Salvation and eternal life. And while there's great theological truth and depth to the garden imagery here, Mary wasn't emotionally able to take these deep theological in, in connections. And she, was, she just knew that her teacher, her rabbi, had died. And she missed him. And more than that, she was grieving over her mistaken hopes about who the Messiah was and what he would do for her and for her people. When we do experience deep grief, as Mary had at that moment, it can be difficult to focus on the, any bigger pictures of life. There have been studies done on the effects of grief in the brain, and it turns out that grieving brains can shut themselves down to only the most basic functioning levels, making abstract critical thinking difficult, sometimes even impossible. This science could account for Mary's confusion and inability to recognize Jesus. She was shut down. Everything had built up to that moment. I mean, that celebration of the palm branches and Jesus was the Messiah. He was going to be acclaimed king. And throughout the week, he was doing great stuff. And then, bam. He was dead. She was grieving. Her friend and Messiah was dead. Her only comfort was in being able to honor his physical body. If I can just do something to show him I love him. And now she could not even do that. Of course, she didn't recognize Jesus. She wasn't looking for him to be alive. She was looking for his dead body. But the story shifts to the gospel mission and message because while Jesus spoke Mary's name, there was this powerful moment of recognition. Jesus saw Mary Magdalene. He knew her. He called her name. She was not just another person grieving. She was his disciple, and he loved her. And here's another thirst, uh, first for, uh, for Christianity. Because the first person who saw the resurrected Jesus was Mary Magdalene. first person to see the risen Christ was not Peter, wasn't John, wasn't the close disciples. It was this close disciple named Mary. Judaism was a male-dominated religion. But Christianity is for all. And Jesus chose a woman to be the first to recognize him as her risen Savior and Lord. And who was this woman God chose to be the first? We have very little information in the Bible about her. Her name, Mary Magdalene, distinguished her from six or seven other New Testament Marys that we know about. And uh, she was from Magdala in Galilee, which is why we put Magdalene on the end of her name, because she was from a particular town and. Uh, and that separates her from all the others. But sometime and somewhere there in Galilee, Mary Magdalene met Jesus. And there's one verse that tells us that Jesus, when he met her, cast seven demons out of her. Think of that. Her life must have been a wreck. There were beings inside of her who controlled her. Seven of them. You're talking about messed up. I don't know what her life was like. In her lucid moments, perhaps she was able to, to do normal things, but most of the, probably they were in control of her at different times, and she had no, they probably even spoke through her.
But the power of Jesus Christ intervened. And those demons had to obey. And they had to go in the name of Jesus Christ. And she was changed. She was made whole. It was a miracle. She was a miracle of grace. And Mary then joined other women in the band of disciples who traveled with Jesus wherever he went in his ministry. We've got this idea that only these 12 guys were with Jesus. No, there's a reality. If you look at Luke 8, 2, that there were some women. They just weren't prominent in the writings because women weren't allowed to be testimonies of anything or leaders of anything or whatever. But here are these women, including Mary, whenever they started following Jesus, they followed him as well. Wherever he went in ministry. She's mentioned again in Jerusalem at the crucifixion. There we find her at the foot of the cross with the other women when the male disciples had run away and hidden in fear. When he was arrested. Remember, they all took off. John's the only one who made it back. But there is Mary Magdalene. And in our passage today, she's the first person to encounter the resurrected Christ. And after she recognized and called him her teacher, Jesus gave her a mission. She was given the first task of Christian evangelism. Jesus told her to tell the other Christians, the disciples, that he was alive. Jesus was once again doing something new. Important task, important news like this was never given to a woman. Because in their society, they were viewed as lacking credibility. The witnesses had to be men. But Christ empowered Mary to share the gospel, and she left their encounter in the garden changed. She was now Mary Magdalene, who had seen the risen Christ, and she became Mary, the first evangelistic sharer of the good news. This encounter with the resurrected Christ taught Mary that the resurrection is something that we need to share. This is not something that we need to keep just to ourselves. It's not to be hoarded. And we are, we are called to be resurrection community, called out of sin, called out of death, just like Mary and the disciples. We live in a hopeful expectation that just as Christ is raised, we too one day will be resurrected. We have something beyond this world Amen. to live for. If you think all this is all there is, I hope you're really disappointed. If you think this is as good as it gets, no, the Bible says eye has not ear nor or heard nor seen and ear has not heard. That, right, my eyes and my ears messed up. Well, if you had to look at this group, you'd get messed up too. <laughs> See, we're going to be resurrected. And we're not going to have to worry about ever voting again. We're not going to have to worry about campaign signs anymore. We're not going to have to worry about who wears masks and who doesn't, or who's vaccinated and who's not, and who's this and who's that. It ain't going to matter. No, it ain't. And it ain't going to matter. I said ain't three times. It won't matter. All of this is over. And turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going to be perfect. There you go. Rub it in a little bit. Because if they think you're really cool now, wait until they see you in heaven. So with that hope, we go into the dead places of the world and we breathe resurrection into them. Joining the Holy Spirit in the good work of sowing seeds of hope, resurrection, and eternal life in heaven. This ain't all there is, folks. There's something else. And that's the third point, new life from death. Because I read something new this week about this passage. After John and Peter left, uh, uh, Mary, John and Peter went back. Mary Magdalene was weeping outside the tomb. And she looked in. 
And it says in verse 12, she saw two angels. And what were they doing? They were sitting, one at the head of the other, at the feet. One at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain in the tomb. So there's this slab in this tomb, this cave. And you go in there, and there's a stone slab in there. And sitting at one end is an angel. Sitting at the other end is an angel where his body had lain. That's interesting. The presence of the angels showed that something divine had occurred with the missing body of Jesus. Now, they're going to tell this lie that the disciples stole away his body. And they're going to spread it around, that there wasn't a resurrection. But it's interesting that when they were there and they saw these angels, their presence along with the folded face cloth. Now, if they'd removed the linen wrappings that were around him, guess what would have happened? He'd have had to leave naked. They were there to show that his body was gone. And who would take the time, if it was a grave robber, to fold the napkin up? There was cloth that was over his head. But there's something else here, because early church theologians wrote that the position of the two angels was significant. Each sat at the two ends of where Jesus' body had been laid. And this reminded them of the two angels at the two ends of the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant with their wings spread out over that sacred spot. And you remember the Ark of the Covenant had this mercy seat on top. And what was put on the mercy seat every year? The blood of atonement for sin. The mercy seat was the Old, plus, Old Testament place of atonement for sin where the blood of the sacrificial lamb was sprinkled. The empty tomb may also be seen as the place where the once dead, now alive Jesus made atonement for sin. His blood stains were there on that rock slab in the tomb, but he was gone. He was alive. This was another first because Christianity is the only religion where there is a belief in new life coming out of death. The Lamb of God died to take away the sins of the world. That was the message of John the Baptist. And now it was a, <coughs> a present reality. Anyone who believed in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ could now be forgiven from his or her sins. New life from death. Those who die to the old life of sin will begin a new life in Christ. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Those who experience new life from death have a desire to tell others. This initial fresh experience of new life compels us to share Jesus. What did he do for you? He took my old life of sin away. He gave me a new life, a resurrection life, to live in him. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. Things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. There's a great change since I've been born again. <laughs> yeah, we used to sing that growing up. We didn't do that, though. There's a great, great change since I've been born. Any of you sing that song? Where'd y'all grow up? New life. This new life compels us to share, but the enthusiasm of that new life in Christians begins to wane, doesn't it? It's not long. When he first gets saved, he's running around, he's carrying on, oh, telling everybody about Jesus, Jesus saved me and changed me. And then all the old timers, just wait a few minutes, he'll calm down. <laughs> he'll be like the rest of us in a little while, and he'll bump on a log. And so, but this is what our story is. The Resurrection Sunday reminds us. Because people living in death, this is why our enthusiasm wanes. 
People living in death do not readily accept the message of change. They've been living there so long that they won't accept somebody coming along, bubbling along into their life saying, oh, guess what happened to me? I went to church. I got saved. I'm different. Jesus took my sins away. Woo, woo, woo. And they're like, ugh. They don't accept it. They're people of death. It's hard for them to understand the possibility of life. That's why they struggle. And so that's why our enthusiasm wanes a little bit over time, because you can only keep trying to pump people up and get excited about what God did in your life when they just want to live the same old way. But living the resurrected life means walking down that hard road to the cross where we lay down our old lives of greed and selfishness and pride and racism and all this other stuff. It also might mean laying down our very lives for those around us. It means doing hard things and going into difficult situations and sharing Jesus. Christians have gone and still go to the worst places of the world, trusting in the hope of resurrection. Resurrection people do not fear hard places, but seek to bring hope and the light and life of resurrection into those hard places, into your school, into your work. I'm not saying get up in front of an assembly and declare Jesus has saved you, unless you're one of those kind of people, but you have a friend. I'm not saying you go to work, And make a big spectacle of yourself, but there's a friend there at work. There's somebody in your life that needs to know that Jesus changed you from darkness to light. Resurrection people know that in the power of our Holy Spirit living in us, we can do hard things. Because greater is he that lives in us than he who lives in the world. And this is the resurrection power that Jesus gives us. To share his good news. We sometimes talk about the spirit of Christmas being the one that lives on throughout the year. But Christians know that it'd be more appropriate to talk about the meaning of Easter. The spirit of Easter living on throughout the year. Because Christmas, although it's a cute, lovely story about a baby... Not so cute when you think about it in a stable with all the smells and everything else that was going on in there. But we still think, oh, the baby, oh, the baby. And we love that imagery. We don't like the imagery of a cross and the empty tomb as much. That's adult stuff. But still, we know that Christmas has no meaning unless there's an Easter. Because the fact that he was born is not enough. It's the fact that he died and rose again that makes a difference in, in our lives. So while I love the beginning of the story, I love the ending so much more. Resurrection is just not something that happened one time and we commemorate it once each year. Rather, resurrection is a way of life. It's a way we live. It's the reason Christians today are ready to die. You don't have to hold on to this world. When it's your time, let me go. Let me go. Like a pastor friend was sharing to me this story. And he's talking about how his mother was on hospice and how she was, and he, he just wanted, he didn't want her to go. And she finally turned to him one day and said, if I'm the reason, if you're the reason I'm still here, let me go. Because he wasn't willing to let her go. If you're the reason I'm still here, when it comes to Christians, let us go. We're going to heaven. We finally won our race. We're finally there. We're going to heaven. We can be with Jesus. And so he said he had to go to Burger King or something to get a lunch. And while he was gone, she went, woo! I've seen that happen so many times. And they sit there and they just, I'm not going to leave. 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 Until she dies. Well, guess what? When they're gone, they're gone. Because it's time to go home to be with Jesus. 
So we sometimes talk about Christmas, but it's really resurrection is the way. It's the reason we're ready to go, ready to die. Winston Churchill. Remember him from history class, kids? Pretty important. In England, they don't teach history anymore, do they? Yeah. Well, anyway, he planned his own funeral. It was held in St. Paul's Cathedral. He, ch he chose all these familiar hymns to be sung and, and uh, uh, Anglican liturgy to be read. And so he, cho he chose it and figured it all out, but he had two surprises. Integrated into the service. I'm going to plan my own funeral. I know people have written their own obituary. There's some things that you just want to say, some things that you just want to have. Maybe I'll have them sing Speak Jesus at my funeral. It's powerful. All right. Well, anyway, up in the dome, he had a bugler. And unknowns to them, toward the end of the service, he had this bugler get up and play taps. I don't think it had ever been done before. St. Paul's Cathedral. <laughs> Day is done. Gone the sun. From the hills, from the lake, from the skies, all is well. Safely rest. God is nigh. Then came a dramatic change. From the other side of the dome, another bugler played the notes of Reveille. It's time to get up, it's time to get up, it's time to get up this morning, it's time to get up. <laughs> Can you imagine? Everybody expects taps, in fact they do it it's at our, at, uh, sometimes in our uh, military gravesides. But nobody expected Reveille. It was Churchill's wish that the sounds of death would be replaced by the notes of resurrection. Because his life wasn't over. And my friends, Christians are people of Christ's resurrection. We live in ways that breathe new life into the world around us. We look for where the Holy Spirit is at work and ask God to show us, how can I get involved in your work today? We share stories of when and where God has breathed new life into us, and we look ahead to the resurrection of the dead, not passively, but in hopeful expectation, and we declare Jesus Christ is alive. Christ is risen here this morning. Here we declare it in this sanctuary and with our church family, and then we go out into the world to work for and speak of and declare resurrection to the people around you because they don't know. My daughter works in a daycare. It's connected to a church, huge church. They got everything. And here she is with preschool kids this week. Telling them the story of Easter. And five did not even know the story. We're living in a day when people are being raised who don't know about Jesus. And how he died and rose again. And so she shared the story of Jesus with these four-year-olds. And said, would anybody like to ask Jesus into your heart? And they all raised their hand. And she prayed a prayer of salvation over those kids. See, we have found life. And his name is Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We live in a world that is so totally confused right now. They don't know which ends up, where to look to for hope, because all the doctors and all the prognosticators and everybody who's got an agree and the professors and everybody else are all confused because they don't start with Jesus. 
So what we have is a swirl in a pool of untruths. And Jesus is the only truth in the middle of all of that. That's why Paul says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So we have found life, and his name is Jesus, and we celebrate the power of resurrection. And you and I are here to say thank you, God, for your death and resurrection this morning, for your salvation and your eternal life. And the question begs to be asked, do you know Jesus as your Savior? If you are still living a life of sin and death, and you don't understand why Christians are different, today is your opportunity to experience the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Because For me and the weirdos like me, this is real. We've seen the change. We felt it. We believe it. We've experienced it for ourselves. And we want you to know Jesus is the answer. As praise team comes, we're going to have an opportunity for you to come and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ this morning. We want you to come and praise him. Some of you may want to come and kneel at this altar and just say, thank you, Jesus, for what you did. And thank him for that power of resurrection that's working in your life. The change that God makes and is continuing to make in you. But also, we'd like to invite someone who is struggling today. A lot of issues in your life, a lot of hurts, a lot of confusion. And maybe you just want to talk to Jesus and say, Lord, I... I haven't been real faithful in my prayer time, but I need you today. I've been struggling with something going on in my life. But, oh, Jesus, I need to talk to you today because I know that your name is power. Your name is strength. Your name is wisdom. Your name is life. You give us life. And I need some life into my being today. Somebody may want to just come down and say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. Sorry for the way I've been running my own life. It's not working the way I'm running it. So Jesus, I want you to run my life from now on. And confess those sins to Jesus and ask him to come in and take over. And then follow his leadership and read his word and pray to him every day. And talk to a Christian and get involved. And get plugged in to the resurrected power of Jesus Christ. It's family altar time where the family of God meets and talks to Jesus. And we just like to invite anyone to make a special trip and talk to the Lord this morning. You can talk to him in your seats. I understand that, but there's something sometimes just a little special about saying, I want to talk to him. I want to call out that name, Jesus. And so that's what we, these, these wooden benches are here this morning to kneel at and talk to him as they sing a song. Lord, we just open ourselves up to you today, tell you we love you and we want to serve you. And here in this few moments of prayer, allow us, Lord, to be honest and open before you and share our needs and our concerns and our thanks because you are God. You are Lord. You are Jesus Christ. And we believe in you. In Jesus' name. Amen.
pray. Lord, we just thank you that you are here this morning. You hear our prayers. You hear, Lord, our concerns. You know the burdens on our hearts. And you know the praises that some of us feel, Lord. But the other side of us is seeing this ugliness of this world. But we have to focus on Jesus, the light of the world. And so, Lord, today we just focus on you for just a few moments and just say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for being the difference maker. Thank you, Lord, for changing B.C. to A.D. Thank you, Lord, for changing everything, for starting Christianity, for dying on the cross, for giving us eternal life, for giving us hope, for giving us, Lord, a home in heaven, realizing, Lord, this is not all there is. That, Lord, we live with you forever. And so, Lord, today we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and our resurrection to eternal life. And thank you, Lord, that we can know you in the power of your resurrection. And Lord Jesus, now we pray for that one that is still struggling. Someone who's watching this service online today, that it is home and stuff is not going good for them. Will you help them, Lord, to realize that God loves them? that you care about their needs and their burdens and their concerns. I'm talking to somebody this week who watches faithfully but doesn't come. Lord, be with that person, we pray. We pray that they will feel and be encouraged and know that you know their name. You know their issues. And Lord, you love them. And Lord, encourage them, we pray today. There's, Lord, family members and friends that will be getting together some for Easter dinner today. May we, Lord, be able to talk about good things and get away from the focus of the, the world around us and all the, the destruction and death and, and violence and so on. But, Lord, help us to realize that there is an answer, and his name is Jesus. And we praise you, Lord, for the resurrection and this hope that we have and your love for all of us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Thank you for that truth today. Be with us now in these resurrection moments as we worship you. And Lord, we pray that we will leave knowing you go with us in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship. Men of
I'd like to encourage everyone to look at your bulletins. There's a lot of good stuff in here and ways to be involved and connected. Um, so don't forget to look at those. Let's sing our last song together. I serve a risen Savior He's in the world today I know that he is living, whatever man may say. I next see the hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always here. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see His love and care. And though my heart grows weary, I never. That he is leading you all the stormy glass. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. And he walks with me and talks with me along my narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to Rejoice, O oh Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujah to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. 
and other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along my narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to everybody. God bless you.